All right. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Mahela Henschel, and I serve as the Marketing and Communications Specialist for the town. And I will have the honor of kind of facilitating this panel tonight. So just thank you for being here. Thank you for your time and coming together to kind of discuss safety and preparedness in our community. We've got a really great panel for you. And then after that, we'll have some time for community Q&A. We'll get started just with introducing, having our board of trustees members that are here introduce themselves. If you want to just raise your name, say your hand, that'd be great. Raise your name, say your hand. <laughs> Thank you. Very good start here. Awesome. Thank you all. And then we'll have our panel introduce themselves. If you'll start with your name and then just a quick how you how you got to be where you are. How'd you come to serve our community? So what you do for our town or the broader county. Um, that'd be great. We'll start right here with Kevin. My name is uh, Kevin Johnston. I'm a sergeant with the Lamar County Sheriff's Emergency Services Unit. I've uh, been with the Sheriff's Office 28 years. Uh, started out there as a dispatcher, a 911 dispatcher for five years. My background's in forestry. I did work for the Forest Service up in the Red Feather Lakes, Laramie River Valley. Um, so then uh, transferred out to emergency services in 2000, and then the sergeant um, at five years later and kind of been there ever since. So seen a lot in my my time here, you know, fires and floods and COVID. I didn't, <laughs> so I'm hoping we don't get any insects or anything, you know, for all the, the pestilence. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Michael Patterson, the fire chief here in Wellington. I've been here for now uh, just about a year and a half. Um, prior to that, um, I spent the bulk of my time in the fire service, some just over 32 years now with the city of San Jose. I spent just a little over 20 years uh, with the city of San Jose. I started my fire service career as a volunteer in Brighton, Colorado in 1984 and uh, kind of chasing, chasing the fire dream job, made my way back to California and did some time as a reserve and paid on call with Cal Fire before I got hired with the uh, city of San Jose. Uh, retired from there as a deputy chief of operations in 2018 and then uh, worked in the county with uh, a group called the Front Range Fire Consortium, which was 10 fire agencies in Northern Colorado and Southern Wyoming. And our charge was pretty much just taking care of the Recruit Academy training for those agencies in there. So um, I've lived in the community now for going on eight years. I'm in the, the Western edge of our fire district off County Road 15. So I'm happy to be of service here and looking forward to having the discussion and talking about that from here forward. So good panel and thanks for coming. Is this, is this the time? Yes, I'm waiting. Wait, waiting. Uh, Matt Cherry, Larimer County Sheriff's Office. I'm your uh, Wellington Sergeant. I've been in law enforcement now for uh, 23, 24 years now. I uh, got into the uh, into law enforcement right out of the uh, the Marine Corps. I was stationed out in Bridgeport, uh, California, in the Mountain Warfare Training Center. So I got uh, used to the mountains. Uh, became a reserve deputy right out of the Marine Corps. Became a jail, uh, jail deputy. Then I went on patrol. Uh, my wife insisted that we come back to Colorado, so I said yes, dear. And we we packed up the house, came out here. We've been out here since 2004. Um, most of my times have been on patrol. I had uh, about seven years on SWAT. Um, I was a less lethal operator on the team. SWAT has kind of morphed into special weapons and tactics to what they call Archer now, which is the all hazards crisis response team. SWAT SWAT slash Archer gets tossed anything and everything that um, just the regular deputies can't handle. So if it's fires, floods, tornadoes, uh, the, the team gets sent out to, to do evacuations. So I had quite a bit of um, help with that with the Windsor tornado, uh, trying to get ahead of the, the tornado and uh, evaluating the, the uh, storm path for that. Uh, of course, all the fires and floods in uh, Larimer County have been uh, either part of that incident command or just doing some of the evacuations myself. Um, I'm now your sergeant here in, in Wellington and um, it's been a lot of fun so far. I might make a few things up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I can I can talk for a longer. Um, so I'm Cole Parrott. I'm the deputy emergency manager for Larimer County um, for the Office of Emergency Management here. and. And uh, before that, I was a consultant with a, a private sector uh, firm and emergency management as well. And prior to that, was a probation officer for a little while. But 
been with the county for a little over five years now and uh, been in this role since the beginning of 2023. Not only do I not have as much to say, but now <laughs> <laughs> that's about it for me. Yeah, exactly. It was like, all right, and he's done. It's like a spot. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Derek Rosenquist, one of the other sergeants with the emergency service unit with the sheriff's office. I actually started with sheriff's office in 1993 as an on-call wildland firefighter, uh, spent 12, 14 years with the park service, 12 of those on a hotshot crew. Um, I was kind of bored in the winter, so I worked for the ambulance up in Estes Park in the wintertime for a big part of that, and then eight years with the fire department up there, and then eight years ago, came back to the sheriff's office. So. Hi, everybody. I'm Ricardo Perez. I'm also with the Larimer County Office of Emergency Management. I'm an emergency management coordinator. Um, yeah, I work here with Cole as well. Uh, my role is more uh, community engagement and being the public information officer for the emergency operations center when that activates. Um, but yeah, I assist in providing uh, preparedness information, uh, engaging with folks in the community, assisting uh, community events and, and seeing how we can kind of make public information uh, a little bit more accessible as well. Uh, so we're working on, on some cool things, but um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and happy to be with the panel. All right, so as we all know, emergency preparedness is a big, broad, wide topic that we could spend hours for weeks and still have more room to cover. So the intention tonight is really to set that foundation. How do all these agencies work together to provide emergency support for our community? And then to also to hear from you, what questions do you have? Um, obviously, there's a lot happening in the news right now, so that, that's brought up questions for our community and for other communities. And so really just to have an opportunity to um, get engaged in a dialogue, but we'll start with kind of a broad question. So I don't know if you all need to answer, but maybe one person from each organization kind of help us understand what's the role of Larimer County, the town of the town of Wellington and first responders and the event of a community emergency. How do we all kind of work together? <laughs> uh, I'll address uh, some of that. So our unit, the emergency services unit, if you're not familiar with it, kind of a big topic or the big uh, calls we go on are wildland fire, uh, search and rescue, weather, uh, and hazmat. Uh, so those are kind of the, the four uh, incidents that we respond to. Now, for uh, like hazmat, and I'll defer to the chief here, you know, the fire department starts off, we just get kind of notified, like we, like we were mentioning the water treatment plant issue. We just come up here to make sure everything was going good. More in that role, we don't put on like suits, uh, you know, and try and do that. That's the the hazmat teams um, for like search and rescue, you know, we do that falls under us with the assistance of the fire department and the, and the deputies. If we had the like soapstone and red mountain, some of those areas, or even in town, you know, we're seeing more with the Alzheimer's dementia, people kind of wandering, you know, we get called for that. Not usually where the SAR team is because they're used to more like I'll call it the wilderness, if you will, or the mountains. Um, but we are seeing more in that urban uh, area. So again, you might see us more, more in that kind of coordinating that in that kind of incident command or joint command with that. Uh, wildland fire, again, from our unit, it starts off with the fire department. So Wellington fire um, would start off and then usually they either ask for our assistance or sometimes we get paged at the same time and we're going to come. And then as the incident evolves, um, it goes, you know, from Wellington fire and then um, if if it exceeds their either resources or monetary ability, it bumps up to the county level and then it bumps to the state, you know, kind of up that line, like uh, you saw maybe Cameron Peak and High Park for those of you around, you know, the way those fires kind of step them themselves up for the management, fiscal and financial responsibilities. So on the smaller fires, yeah, we, we are up here providing you know, some of our resources, either Derek or I, or some of the specialists in that IC role. And then we do have our on-call wildland firefighters, and now we have an initial attack module. So we have some full-time people year round, uh, which is relatively new. It came up after Cameron Peak. Uh, Sheriff Smith was able to, you know, we got some money to keep our firefighters on because the on-calls, you know, we could send out a page and get two, I could get 50, but we have right now, we'll have eight in May that are on year round that at least kind of give us that first uh, initial thing going out the door. 
And then evacuations, like we work closely with, uh, you know, Sergeant Cherry and the Archer, you know, determining that and we can help, you know, do that in that um, evacuation role if we're, we're, we're tasked with that. And I'll let other people kind of chip in too. So. <laughs> so from the fire department's end, I think I'll break it down kind of into two pieces. So it's prevention on one side and response is the other. So prevention on our side of it, we do things like the adoption of codes and the enforcement of codes so that hopefully a event that happens in the community doesn't become a larger scale or a catastrophic type event through um, talking about wildfire or those kind of things. So that's kind of the first part, but specific to a emergency in the community, then it becomes the response model. And um, so our, our biggest piece is as we start to look at the size of our district that we cover, and then Wellington being an integral part and really the core piece of that, but we do cover 288 square miles. So um, very quickly, an event that's anything more than a single medical call, a single type of uh, vehicle accident that has extrications can overwhelm us just on the, on the small end. So we work very closely hand in hand with people you're seeing at the table, but also our other mutual aid partners. So our fire agencies and that type of thing. So from the response end of it, I think one of the most important things we do initially is a quick assessment of what an incident looks like, and then try to use a term that they taught in the military that comes through, but we call recognition prime decision-making. So we try to look at things that we see and in a quick manner, try to determine the amount of resources, where's it at, where's it going, and then try to do a quick count of resources on what do we think we need if this thing's gonna get um, past our span of control and start making those calls for help early. Um, one of the things that we that we keenly recognize is we're in a geographic uh, challenge location being almost the farthest north area. We do cover all the way to the Wyoming border. So our assistance comes from either volunteer fire departments that are to our east or west or the paid fire agencies that are farther south. And then as that concentric rings go farther and farther away. So it just becomes potential for a longer response. So for us, it's um, preventing what we can trying to recognize early the gravity of an incident and then estimating kind of what resources we need and making those calls early. Um, our kind of motto is we can always cancel them, but if we start them late, they're gonna get here later and later, so. The, the what? The oh, yeah. That's right about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll get into that. Yeah. So really, what we're looking at is incident command, um, managing our resources. The sheriff's office can't do this alone. Wellington Fire can't do this alone. Even emergency services, you know, they can't do any of this alone. It's got to be teamwork all the, all the way across the board. Deputies are usually the the canaries in the coal mine if uh, when when it comes to any type of emergencies, um, because usually 99.9% .9 of the time we're showing up first and assessing what that scene is, what the emergency is. And then we just start immediately kicking into incident command. I don't care who the who the person is with the sheriff's office that's showing up first on scene. We're all taught uh, incident command, being able to take charge of a situation, whether it's me, it's a captain, or it's it's one of the deputies that are on the street that are all taught just take charge, take charge, figure out what we have, and then it just builds from there. A supervisor may show up on scene and take over, or the deputy will run with it. Um, but it, in any case, um, we're going to just start bringing in additional resources. Um, and then and then it's just teamwork. If, if the chief shows up, hey, chief, this is what I got. Um, let's work together to figure out, you know, what the problem is. Um, he starts, whether he wants to take over the, the scene because it's a major fire or hazmat or something along those lines, he and I talk about it, but he and I are shoulder to shoulder managing whatever that problem is. Um, with the hazmat uh, incident that happened on 3rd Street, uh, that started off with the, the two of us. Uh, yeah, the two, two of us on scene. Um, but I like the big brains of, of, not to say that we're not, the, we're not big brains, but uh, emergency services, boy, they, got a, they have a lot of knowledge about how to handle some of these things. So I, I reached out to, to Kevin. Kevin came out and was just, you know, hey, think about this, think about that. It's not, for, it's not time for me to jump in and tag you out, um, but he was there to, to be a resource. And that's what it is. It's teamwork all the way across the board between law enforcement, firefighters, um, uh, emergency services, even up to emergency management to, to try to figure out 
how are we going to solve this particular issue? Um, that's all it is, teamwork. And I'll steal a little bit of a uh, analogy that Jefferson County, uh, the emergency manager, manager down there, uses just to kind of give you guys the difference between emergency management and emergency response, because that's kind of confusing when people ask us what exactly we do. Um, but he, the emergency manager in Jefferson County, uses this analogy of kind of the splash zone. Um, and that is that the emergency response is responding to, let's say, like a, a fire, right? Is this is for this analogy, this this rock you're throwing into a pond. Um, so whatever this incident is, is, is the, the rock. And the big splash is the incident, right? That's where uh, the law enforcement, EMS, fire, all those folks are responding to um, what's what's getting wet in the splash zone, where emergency management is a lot different. And there's just because uh, there is a, a big splash, right? That's not the end of the incident. There's a, these, these incidents cause big ripple effects into the communities. And that's where kind of OEM stay. We stay out of that splash zone. We don't get wet. Um, that's your, your guys, um, right. The, the cool stuff. So, um, we are, we, we operate the emergency operations center. We stay way back and we're thinking about, um, the community and we're, we're thinking consequence management. So it's, we're thinking, um, you know, the next day or the two days from now. And this is usually, again, when incidents are getting bigger, if it's just a, a smaller hazmat incident, OEM is probably not getting involved. Um, these are your, your big fires or big floods where um, the there's a need for emergency management to come in and kind of help to to organize all the different uh, folks that are involved from the municipalities to um, fire agencies to law enforcement agencies, all those kind of things where we're talking and, and um, taking, not only supporting these guys with resources, um, to make sure they can do what they need to do, but also um, coordinate the Red Cross and help folks to get um, sheltering and working with our policy group to make sure that our leadership um, for whatever, you know, is making the right decisions or or it has the uh, ability to uh, get together. So a lot of those kind of things um, is what emergency management's more focused on. Um, and yeah, and, and, and also technically for state statute, the uh, emergency manager for a municipality or for a, is, I guess it has to have an, a designated emergency manager or the county kind of kind of does that. So with with Wellington, we we are here to support you guys um, with that. Um, for any honestly, that's the same with I think Fort Collins, Estes, and Loveland are the only municipalities and in, in our county that have designated emergency managers. So the others um, we kind of work closely with and and make sure that we're there to support you in, in larger events. Um, as needed. So, yeah. I think Kevin covered most of our stuff. Um, one of the other things we've talked about the initial emergency, some of the response and something else we work from emergency services and we work closely with uh, office of emergency management is uh, being prepared before the emergency starts. Um, one of the jobs for emergency services is uh, wildfire safety. Most folks think wildfire safety, they think up in the mountains, but if you look statistically, lots and lots of homes burn in grass fires, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, things like that. And we've seen large rapid moving grass fires here. Um, we are hiring a brand new full-time wildfire safety coordinator, a wildfire partners program coordinator. So they'll have a person who can actually spend the time to actually reach out to everybody in the county versus where most of the focus has been up in the hills. So that's a resource that we'll be able to bring to Wellington and the surrounding communities. Um, so we've lost, we've lost a couple of homes here in Wellington in the past couple of years due to some of these grass fires that have come through. So helping get some of that education out as well to, again, like the chief was saying, that prevention and preparedness before the incident starts. Carter, I don't know if you have, do you have anything to add? I'll, I'll add one thing. Um, yeah, and I think Cole did an awesome job sharing about emergency management. Uh, the only thing I'll add is, um, and also adding to, to Derek's point was, um, yeah, so we work to provide uh, the public information around preparedness and, and really, a, between um, before an emergency, during and after, right? So it, kind of the whole, that whole um, that whole phase. But um, yeah, we do, we have a lot of preparedness information, and we work really closely with 
Lena 911, so Larimer Emergency Telephone Authority. Um, and they, they share kind of what to be able to share with the public, how to sign up for emergency alerts, uh, engaging with the public. You know, Lena 911 has a lot of uh, ways for folks to sign up for emergency alerts. Um, so they, they really do an awesome job in, in um, being that authority to, to provide emergency alerts in the county. So I think every one of the partners here really promotes um, the work that Lita does. And, and yeah, they're, they're an awesome partner as well. So I'll just add them. Thank you for that. If you're signed up for Lita, raise your hand. If you're not, if your hand is not raised, don't leave this room without signing up. That's definitely how you get emergency response communication or emergency alert communication in our community. One, one thing I will say, again, I've been in this county since 1982. Um, and like Matt uh, and the chief brought up, you know, I think here in Lamar County, and that includes Wellington, we've had the benefit of, you know, we have 19 fire departments, three ambulances, four police, three federal agencies. The cooperation we have on these incidents is really outstanding. There's other counties, even in Colorado, and, I, and I've been around the country as some of these other folks are, it's not like that. You know, not picking on people. If you remember Waldo Canyon, when they were doing a press conference, it, it was awkward when you had... You know, you don't see that. I'm not saying we're perfect by any stretch, but I think here in Larimer County, we have that good working communication and working environment. We know each other and it just, it's chaos during an incident. You know, it's hurting cats and you're trying to round up the cats as fast as you can to move forward. So I think here in Larimer County and for the Wellington community, you know, we have that base. So that's always a good thing. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. If you're following along on my questions, I'm switching up the order. So what should residents do to prepare their own households for emergency response or preparedness? All right. <laughs> <laughs> have, and, I know, yeah. First thing, yeah. sign up for NOCO alerts. Um, that is one of the best things you can do. Um, the other thing, if you go to the Office of Emergency Management's website, they have a lot of resources about how to prepare for emergencies, how to prepare for evacuations. A uh, couple things, I do this myself. I keep a 24 hour bag in my personal vehicle um, where if I get stuck somewhere, I am good for 24 hours. And then I've got a stuff, not necessarily sitting at my door because I can live out of my truck for three days, my work truck, but uh, within 10 minutes, I can grab 72 hours worth of stuff at home, including all of my important papers, um, spare glasses, reading material, um, and extra batteries for or battery chargers for cell phones. So OEM has a site that has a 72-hour pa packing list on it. Um, so that would be a great thing to have. And so no co alerts going to that website and having stuff ready or at least a box that you can pick up and grab if you need to leave quickly. And then the big thing, paying attention to the weather. You guys get slammed up here with hailstorms, um, heavy rains, snow. Um, so being prepared for that. Um, and then, you know, obviously that's kind of big picture and I'm sure Mike would agree with me. Practice fire drills in the home. Does your family know more than one way out uh, of the house in case the smoke detectors go off, which we had the time change a couple weeks ago. Everybody should have uh, changed the batteries in their smoke detectors. I'm going to be a little Debbie Downer here. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to get you prepared mentally here. So uh, I, I honestly don't worry about fires, floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, any of those types of things. It's the more catastrophic type things like a, the loss of our power grid um, that is really weighing on my mind lately, just thinking about my own family's preparation. And the biggest thing that anyone in this room and our community can be thinking about is self-preservation. And, and you're looking at, okay, why are we up here? Um, government is great. Government does a lot of things for you, but it can't do everything for you. Um, so along the lines of what Derek's talking about is, is you need to be able to take care of yourself you know, for a couple of days, a week, a couple of weeks, you know, if we are, if we lose power, you know, for um, a long period of time, I have some very serious concerns just about what society is going to do to itself. Um, so it's so super, super important that our community is 
is thinking about that, stocking up your own food stores, not, not thinking, well, the Ridley's is just down the street. Because, I mean, I don't know if you saw what happened with toilet paper, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, there was a mad rush for toilet paper when people just got kind of hinked out about, um, oh, my gosh, everybody's going to buy toilet paper, so I have to go buy it. So once people start seeing there's a mad rush on the the the, the grocery stores, the gas station, um, liquor stores, um, people are going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but those those shelves are going to get pretty bare pretty darn quickly. And if you're not prepared with your own food, your own water, your own way to defend yourself, because you know as well as I do, if society starts going south, law enforcement, anytime I teach a class, we always talk about if not us, then who. Um, we're going to be there, but you also got to be thinking we have our own families too. What is, you know, if, if society starts to break down a little bit, again, I'm not trying to paint this totally grim picture that, oh my God, it's, it's worthless. Um, but we got to be thinking about taking care of ourselves for a while until you know, the, the grid comes back up and all of these different resources start coming, coming back online so that we can start helping you, um, but not completely and totally relying on government. And you're, the government's sitting here. Um, but as you've seen around the country with major disasters, sometimes it takes a while for those resources to get to you. And if this is regional and not just localized to our community, those resources are going to be pretty spread thin. So just taking thinking about how do I take care of me for a week, two weeks, maybe longer. That's all I got. One of the other things I, I will add to is we we talk and we have a lot of these resources in our in in uh, on our website for you know what what should be on your in your go bag and things like that too. But one of the biggest things that I've seen that causes a huge hassle for a lot of folks is documentation. And so I think one of the biggest things you can do for preparedness in your own home is uh, to to kind of gather the documents that are important to you. Um, not because if either if it's all on your if it's all on your computer and your home goes away, then that's very bad. Um, or if you kind of have a big filing cabinet with things that are just all over the place, so it's going to be tough to kind of gather those things. So just the way you would prepare um, some of the things in your go bag, like your uh, batteries and flashlights and medication and those kind of things. I also think it's super important to have um, a part of that go kit also include. Uh, folder with some of the, the most important documents, or at least knowing exactly where that is. So you can grab that and go um, just as quick as some of the things that are going to help you. Because uh, when you're evacuated or you're away or, or your home's potentially destroyed, worst case, right? Um, you want to make sure you have access to those things that are are, are important. Um, and that's caused, I think, a lot of folks, uh, you know, some obviously uh, mental distress and everything by not having those things. It, it would regardless, but um, making sure you prepare on that side of it is really good. And then also just even like in the cloud, right? Making Taking some time to like prepare some of the documents that you might have on your computer, but in a place where you can access it if you're not home. And if you're in a disaster or um, emergency while on vacation or somewhere else, making sure you have easy access to those things that you really need. Because it's not just, you know, potentially Wellington where something could happen. You could be um, on vacation when something happens. So Thinking about that is really important. I'll tie in one other thing is we're talking about um, evacuation. There's been a lot of talk about that. And it really is that forethought and the pre-planning of evacuation. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go if you needed to go somewhere for a half a day? Where are you going to go if you needed to go somewhere for a week or two weeks? So family, friends, hotels, start to get that stuff in your mind so it's not a decision at that time, but it's you've already got some things pre-planned for that. Um, one of the things that we see too, talk about the no co alerts and that type of thing is kind of an understanding of what um, pre evacuation is what an evacuation warning is and what an actual evacuation alert is. Um, because one of the things that that we've seen all too well and I think of these guys that are hustling through streets um, in wildfires and that kind of thing trying to um, evacuate those last few homeowners that are now calling 911 because they didn't evacuate early um, and the we are going to be overwhelmed in those kind of incidents. There won't be enough responders to do to to take care of the incident. So any of those that are pulled away to now um, try to help people evacuate that evacuated late or you know, tried to make that determination, I'm going to defend my house or do those kind of things, or they just didn't have a plan and now they're trying to 
wait till last minute and gathering everything that's important to them. Um, we see probably the most loss of life happen for those that are evacuating on the road. Um, if you've watched the Paradise Fire video, um, I just think of our area here, um, go on a Friday afternoon trying to leave when you get towards uh, Fort Collins on I-25, but try to think of putting everybody out of here um, and onto I-25, right? Um, we talk about knowing how to get out of your house because we, we, we're, we're creatures of habit. We go in and go out the same way. So if you're told to leave, you kind of have one way you normally leave your neighborhood. So try to, you know, try to identify some of those other ways to get out. Um, if we had a train derailment, train derailment or some leaking chemicals that we said, you got to go the other direction. Do you know how to get out? Can you get out of town? And can you get five miles away if that's what we're telling you to evacuate? So just think of some of those other things. And like they talked about in the evacuation plan and some of the resources, there's a lot of that in there. So there's a lot of steps to kind of think. And the more you can put yourself at ease that you've pre-thought of those, the, the better you're going to feel about leaving your house when that time comes. So yeah, and just to follow up on that, if you're not familiar here in Larimer County, other counties use different terms like pre-evacuation, you know, that here in Larimer County, we use voluntary, which is like a pre-evac. We don't say pre-evac because then people are like, well, what does that mean? So voluntary, you know, you can leave whenever, um, you know, we saw it, or at least I saw it in the fires, more high part, people were waiting for us to physically come to their house. Now you can evacuate. You don't even need a notice to evacuate. Now you see the fire and you're like, Hey, I don't feel comfortable, but like it got brought up. They're waiting for the government to tell them to evacuate. So you can go, you know, at any time and maybe just, you know, leave us a note or something on the door, you know, so we know you're a gone. So we use voluntary and mandatory here in Larimer County. So those are the terms you'll hear when we're doing evacuation for anything. Uh, we work with Lita, we work with OEM, the deputies, you know, those are the two terms uh, we use. And, and that would be up in Wellington. It would be a voluntary or a mandatory uh, for that. And then remember when you're evacuating, and we see it again on the more fires that I've had experience with, make sure you have stuff for your pets. Because I don't know how many times we had to go back and get, you know, food or medicine for the pet. You know, the people move all their stuff out now, not so much the large animals, but the smaller animals. So. And I'll just add it to that. So the, with the voluntary evacuation, so we, people that have uh, mobility considerations and, you know, people that have pets or have large animals and, um, you know, any, any of those considerations, if you do have, if there is a voluntary evacuation, then those, those folks are encouraged to evacuate just because they, they have a little bit more to, to gather around um, and a few more steps to take if they need to evacuate. So that's just another thing to um, stay aware. Yeah, and with that, if you have someone that, like someone, an older person, they can put a layer in CAD that will highlight when the when the evacuation boundary is. So that gives the fire police, we know we have to get in there. It's going to take us a little longer, you know, to move these people out there in a wheelchair, whatever, you know, the issue is. So they can make a layer, um, and you can sign up. And you used to be able to no sign up. No alerts. Yeah. When, you, when you sign up for an account, it's on there. You yeah. can put that in there so it when dispatch draws that they can say, Hey, the address at one, two, three main has someone that needs help. You know, so the fire department or police or whoever, you know, we know we, we have to go in there to help them, you know, move them out. So it's just doing it right. When it comes mandatory is kind of not the best chance. Cause then it's just, you know, it's, it's hard to do. All right. We'll do one more formal question for the panel and then we will open it up to you all. If you could snap your fingers and implement one system or community resource that would make a positive difference during an emergency in our community, what would that be? Oh, I guess I'll start. And then Ricardo can also talk about this too. But um, I think for us, again, that's like the, the no co alert thing. I, I think that's the most important thing you can do. Um, and that's, if I could snap my fingers, I'd have everyone registered. I mean, we, although we, um, all these agencies together and, uh, lead a 911, we, we all try very hard to, when we're at public events to talk about the importance of making sure you are registered. Cause I don't want to get too much into it, but there's a difference just because you get like, uh, those severe weather alerts doesn't mean you're signed up for, uh, you know, the emergency alerts. There's a lot that we can't necessarily legally send unless we have um, a, a threat to life and safety. So uh, we need to be able to, to notify folks. And by signing up for an account, 
um, on no call alert allows us to not only do that, but do uh, to alert you to m other situations uh, as well and just keep you situationally aware of what's going on um, either all the way through the whole county, if you would like, all the way down to your specific um, community or communities you care about outside, like a uh, um, kid's school, um, spouse's work, those kind of things. You can register for those locations. Um, so I think you can't, I mean, you can do as much preparing as you want, but if you don't know something's happening, you, you know, it doesn't do a whole lot of good. So this is the thing that I would, if I could snap my fingers, it'd be completely, um, everyone would be in Larimer County would be registered for it. And Ricardo, I don't know if you want to talk about the reach well stuff too. Yeah. Um, and then what I'll add to that too, is just having multiple ways to receive emergency alerts. Hmm. So signing up for lead is great. Um, but also just be aware of kind of, if you have television, if you have radio, any other kind of forms, um, yeah, just be, be aware of wherever you can receive information, um, be proactive when possible. Um, but yeah, Lita, one of the forms that they, they communicate with the public is there's a, a reach well app that, um, folks can download on Apple or Android if they have a smartphone. Um, but this application translates, um, the emergency notifications that Lita sends out. Um, right now, Lita only sends out, uh, notifications in English. So then they were able to kind of work with this application reach well to be able to provide this assistance. And um, obviously it's another form that people have to take kind of the step to sign up for. Um, you'll hear that a lot from us is kind of that shared responsibility, that public responsibility to be able to kind of take those steps and, and be, um, yeah, taking kind of initiative for, for their own safety. Uh, we understand that there's some folks that need a little bit of more assistance, obviously. So then kind of that's what we're planning around. Uh, how do we help folks? But um, yeah, that that reach well app is really another way to to communicate with folks that don't that speak other languages other than English. Um, so we're working on promoting that um, along with our partners. But yeah, just get uh, have multiple ways to receive emergency alerts as possible. I think uh, the one thing too in the community, and again, it's changed from when I was a kid. You know, know your neighbors and stuff, and if they need help. You know, I know the neighbors on our block, my teenagers absolutely do not, but I know, <laughs> and I'm, I, you know, I put in my phone their names because I don't, may not see them very often, but, you know, I think that community, and again, Wellington's a little smaller than Fort Collins, but you guys are growing, obviously, so just knowing that, and because like uh, Matt brought up, you know, there's only so many of us, it's going to take us a little bit to get here, maybe, you know, a couple of days. So, you know, helping your neighbors out and, and you see it a lot you know, on TV when these disasters. So I think that's a big thing is, is helping out your neighbor, you know, whatever that is um, and whatever you can do or notifying us and we'll try and get over there sooner. So just that kind of community and, and neighborhood um, awareness is a big thing that I like, you know, would be good in, during a disaster. It sounds kind of dreamy, but uh, I'd really like to see it pretty substantial community food bank uh, or the ability to, to produce our own water. Um, a lot of these things could be contaminated, just depends on what the, the disaster is. And we just, as a community, we need to be able to kind of sustain ourselves for a little while. I don't know what that would look like. I mean, obviously you'd have to have gigantic warehouses full of food to be able to 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 help out our, our community. Um, but water's gonna get contaminated. We're gonna start running out of food, those types of things. Again, I'm I'm thinking large scale type um, of um, emergencies, but there's a lot of people in our community that that are living paycheck to paycheck, or they just don't have the money to to be able to go to, down to Costco and buy pallets of food. Um, so we're going to have to have that ability to be able to to help out our our needy folks in town. So. I think the last thing I kind of tie in on is it it is um, making sure that there's an expectation and then there's also an understanding that that to the scale that that we're talking about some of these emergencies that that the as as Matt talked about Kevin talked about that the governmental system to, to provide that is going to be overwhelmed um, dealing with the emergency and as we talk about it's emergency and then there becomes the recovery the response and recovery afterwards so. Um, what will happen is your your really limited resources that you have of government that's dealing with the emergency. And if we think of standing up an EOC or do those type of things, when we have multiple days of that, the people that fill those roles are also the same people that are on the response end most often. So 12 hour operational periods of response and then 12 hour operational periods in the EOC. So it, it kind of goes back to 
the more prepared you are, the better you are to sustain yourself. And just, um, it's, it's a hard decision sometimes, but knowing maybe you, you just have to leave the area for a while until you get the message that it's okay to come back in. Because in a flood emergency or in a wildfire emergency, there's also gonna be a substantial cleanup period where the area is really not safe for people to re-inhabit. And then that time will come as they can. Maybe it's gonna be escorted times back in and that kind of thing, but sort of prepare for the worst and hopefully it doesn't come that way. But if you're prepared for the worst it, and it maybe won't be quite as, as overwhelming for you. All right, I think we'll open it up to community questions. If you just speak loudly or if you're more comfortable, there is a mic at that podium up there, whatever works for you. If you shout your question, I will repeat it. Anyone have any burning questions? <laughs> uh, just kind of the question that's on my mind we've um, kind of seen a lot of stuff happening with school shootings so we've kind of heard Sergeant Terry but others around the um, here in the state and around the country uh, the last couple of months what does that look like from our standpoint of being prepared for that and being able to respond to situations like that just for those online the question was about a school shooting if that were to happen what would a response and preparedness look like in our community Pretty fantastic question, and that's uh, something that we've been we've been talking about um, because at this at this point, my battery's going dead, so my ear, earpiece is bleeping in my ear. Um, are, are we as prepared as we should be? No, I don't think that we are. Um, law enforcement, we are are really good at seeking out the bad guy. We do a lot of training for that. Um, our guys are mentally. Um, I like to say emotionally prepared to, to be able to go into that environment and seek out the bad guy and, and do what they need to do. Um, more broadly though, law enforcement has to have a really good relationship with our uh, other first responders, fire, de fire departments, uh, paramedics, those types of folks, because we're gonna run out of people. You know, We talk about teamwork, uh, agencies working together. We're going to run out of uh, resources very, very quickly. Um, so we're going to be waiting for uh, other law enforcement agencies to respond. If you don't think that Fort Collins uh, Police Department, Loveland Police Department, Windsor Police Department, Johnstown Police Department, Colorado State Patrol, um, if something like that happens and it goes out over the radio, everybody is coming. Um, so we start talking about incident command and how do we control all, all of these resources coming in? Oh, my gosh. Um, but we as law enforcement can't handle this by ourselves. So we're partnering with the fire department, EMS, so that we can save lives. We go in to stop the threat, um, but as soon as we stop the threat, we have to start saving lives. Um, I don't want to start talking about, you know, what is going to be uh, happening in that school, uh, but we need to immediately transition into life-saving mode, and that means bringing in firefighters, EMS, and those are conversations that we're having to get to get uh, all of our local responders trained up in that capacity, making sure that even if, you know, we have one bad guy that we have to uh, take out and, and stop that threat, doesn't mean that there's not two, there's not three, there's not four. Um, so making sure that our uh, fire department, EMS, um, that they are appropriately equipped with um, tactical, not necessarily tactical gear, but body armor, uh, ballistic helmets, those types of things, all of this costs, costs a lot of money. Um, but also making sure that we're training together so that if I show up, chief, chief shows up, we both know what our responsibilities are and we just go to work. Um, we're gonna be doing that training this summer. Law enforcement, excuse me, with the sheriff's office, we do this every single year. We find a school in, in Larimer County so we can get all of all the deputies. We even reach out to Larimer County Parks, uh, any of the other agencies that they want to join in, so that we're all on the same page with what this type of response is going to look like. Um, so we do that, but we just don't prepare enough with our fire with the fire department, other EMS responders. Um, it's called Rescue Task Force, and it's basically law enforcement goes in first, and then it's followed on by firefighters and EMS, so that we can start patching holes. Um, and evacuating the wounded. Again, our law enforcement agency, we're very, very good. Um, you will not find a, a single deputy in Larimer County 
um, that doesn't know how to go into um, an active shooter environment. Um, so I, I'm really happy about that. I really wish we had more deputies closer to Wellington. So when those types of thing, if that type of thing happens, um, we have a lot more um, resources available. But realize the world is going to be um, ascent, um, emerging on whatever that that issue is. Um, and then it's really going to be a unified command of, okay, how how are we managing all these people and staging areas and and all these things? So, um, are we prepared? I think to to take the th take on the threat, hundred um, percent. But it's making sure that we're actually doing the the casualty care. If if there's casualties, um, that we're well prepared for that to save lives. In Larimer County OEM, we've we've done we've worked with some of our other partners, um, whether it's law enforcement, fire districts, um, many others, to kind of to do infrastructure assessments. And some of those infrastructure assessments are schools. We've done school a school or multiple schools up in Estes Park, and we've done a school in Loveland. And so we part of that is just is kind of just being an extra set of eyes for these folks. So um, if it's a Cooter School District school, we'll go in and, and do an assessment, um, although they probably looked at this, you know, the security, but we'll go in and, and look at those things and see if we can just put, you know, that, that extra set of eyes on it. And then at the end, provide them a list of recommendations that we feel um, from the fire uh, district, from the law enforcement agency, OEM, others who might be present at this assessment to kind of go in and say, hey, these are some things we would recommend that you guys do, whether it's like behaviors, like leaving doors open or not having a lock at all, you know? So um, we're totally open to that kind of stuff, not just schools, but if um, like the town of Wellington has certain facilities they want to do or have looked at, you know, um, you guys can can uh, reach out and we're happy to kind of put together a team of uh, people, partners like all these here. So, yeah. One one uh, one of the things I'll add on to that too is just um, to the point that we talked about earlier. I think um, one of the things that we do have have strength and is that um, from the smallest in incidents and in the variety of type of incidents that we deal with, we we've been on no less than five or six large scale incidents together: wildfire, the hazmat, um, and so the command the command and communication is usually the first thing that breaks down on larger incidents like that and the ones that are not as successful that's one of the things that they can look back to so i think the fact that we have the opportunity and have exercised it and been able to put it in place in other incidents is what um, is giving me some some positive feeling for the training that we're doing forward and the things that come from there because what we're really good at and what we know from the ems side of it is that um, we deal with uh, multiple multiple casualty incident type of incidents from vehicle accidents on the interstate to um, to multiple injured type of people that aren't specifically related to that. But um, we're really good at um, escalating an incident and building pieces and just adding additional command and control pieces to that from that side. So, so we recognize and in the fire service kind of in that all hazard environment, especially when you're in this type of situation that um, we talk about time on task to getting to a patient and getting them to definitive care. So these patients need surgery. Anything in between is not life-saving efforts. We do some life-saving measures to get them to surgery. So in that type of thing, air ambulances, um, we're looking at you know, the most critical patients closer, and then how do we go air ambulances farther not overwhelm the systems so that they're ready for that. So planning for those kind of things and doing them when we have vehicle accidents and other things, and our other partner agencies that do those to the same point, um, we'll probably have 10 fire agencies that are here um, in our back pocket. Of, um, it's that um, concentric circles getting them here to do that. But um, the wildfire we had up in the hill, we had no less than 10 other fire agencies from around that spent a couple of days with us uh, up on the mountain for uh, taking care of that. So. So last week we had an unprecedented amount of schools that had multiple threats received, um, mostly Christian schools that received an attack and a warning from more than just one school. On top of you guys, we're dealing with another issue here at the Wellington Middle School High School for an additional threat. My question is, how do you divvy up those resources to where attention is paid to multiple, and this might be also 
your wheelhouse as well. Like how do you divvy up you guys to handle multiple incidences such as what we experience? So it all comes down to priorities. Uh, we have to prioritize those threats. Um, and a lot of that is Intel based. So we relied um, heavily on our Intel community. You wouldn't think that the Northern Colorado Drug Task Force um, would be looking at these types of things, but they do. Um, they have analysts that are able to just scour the internet and look for all those um, web-based threats. Um, and then kind of determining what's real or what's not. Um, then we have to start sending investigators out to, to contact these individuals if, if we know who they are and trying to determine is this a credible threat or not. Um, again, prioritizing what these are. We may have something that we just can't, can't validate. We don't know if this is a, a legitimate threat or it's a not a credible threat. In that case, you know, we'll, we'll pull additional resources, you know, for instance, Wellington Middle High School. Um, as soon as we started getting some of these additional threats, we contacted our reserve uh, deputy coordinator and we pulled reserve deputies out to, to stay at the school all day long. That's, that was their only responsibility was to stay at the school. Um, uh, resur Resurrection um, uh, Christian Academy, um, we sent deputies down there. Um, obviously, the, our Wellington deputies can't be um, at the school all day long because we may have to respond to other emergencies. So if that's the case, we'll make sure that we have deputies that are always on the street available to respond to calls, but then we'll pull in, heck, we'll pull in investigators. We'll pull in whoever we need to to be able to secure that, that school um, or that site as best we possibly can. So, um, but a lot of it is, is intel and conducting a proper investigation to vet that threat. And luckily with the threats that happened here in, in Wellington, we were able to quickly identify these are not credible threats. Uh, either we contacted the individuals and they're like, I was just kidding, or I was, this is not serious. They had no, no access to weapons, those types of things. But it was a deputy in their living room talking to them in front of their parents, and then also coming up with a game plan with the school to, to say, okay, well, Johnny can't go back to school until he's gone through a reintroduction program or process uh, to make sure that, you know, Johnny's safe. He's not going to harm anyone else. Johnny's just a fake person, obviously. So, yeah. so okay. does that answer your question? It does. Correct. Perfect. And I, I am grateful because the, I did see the LTSO and City of Fort Collins officers at my daughter's school when she went to school on Friday. So extremely grateful that there was an active amount of people that were coming in and out of her school at that time. Sure. Um, the other question you talk about EDAP, I think is what it is compared to no pull alert. Is there a difference between the two or does one immediately connect to the other? So NOCO Alert is a function of LIDA. So LIDA is the organization. LIDA is the Larimer Emergency Telephone Authority. NOCO Alert was a website that got stood up from the Cameron Peak Fire just to be able... So NOCO Alert is a website. Um, it's just a form to be able to visualize any... So there's a Google map on there that any evacuations that are in the county, um, people can go on the website and then visualize these. Um, and then also get any information related to any kind of incident that... Um, Lita is basically sharing information about. Um, so NOCO alert, you can sign up to get those notifications through Lita. Um, so yeah, that that's a uh, NOCO alert is just a function to be able to inform with the public. And then that's where you can sign up for receiving emergency alerts. Um, so yeah, Lita, Lita does a lot. They yeah, so if you're in the, if you're in the area of imminent threat, obviously, if you're in Wellington and then there's something happening across the county that there's no danger to, to this area, you won't receive those alerts. But if um, you're in the area of imminent threat, then you'll receive a notification if you're signed up. And without kind of diving too much into it, the other thing, Lita, um, so as Ricardo talked about, um, they serve a few other functions. So one of the other functions they do is that 
Um, we get dispatched through different dispatch centers, but in a redundant piece, Lita also serves as a backup dispatching center. So um, should the Fort Collins dispatch be down or one of those, or we have a larger scale incident like um, Cameron Peak or like uh, the Estes Park fire, when the 911 calls come in and, and, and overwhelm the dispatch center, Lita is able to stand up. They have redundant systems and they're, they're able to stand up some additional dispatching systems. Plus, um, being an authority, they have some other, so can maybe bring other resources and other things to be able to fund things like this that that um, have broad reaching across the entire county, or they start to partner with um, other counties. So how Larimer County and Boulder County interface in some of these things, you start to see things where people either live near that or work near them. And you may have heard of times where the alerts are kicking across other areas. So they're very proactive in trying to help refine that system so that you're getting the alerts you're supposed to get and not getting the ones that you aren't supposed to get. Um, and they're really, you know, they're, they're super proactive in kind of engaging with all of the partner fire EMS and other agencies within that. So. Yeah. And also with Lita, they have a, in their building down there, there's a dispatch center. So like when we had to evacuate Estes park, when the troublesome fire jumped over, they had to leave their center. They just, they could go to Lita and it's a fully operational dispatch center. So they just kept, so the other centers weren't picking up the, the volume of calls from Estes. Estes could move their dispatchers uh, down. And like the chief said, Lita also looks at technology and some other uh, tools that we use. The latest one is this prepared live. It's a, if you call on a cell phone, dispatch will send you a link. You have to accept it because we can't just come into your phone. And then we see your camera. So dispatch, if, if say you, I think I broke my leg, you could hold the camera over your leg. We would see the injury and then dispatch can send it out to all the responders. So they're like, oh, you know, we better get a helicopter, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, and we used it in emergency services. We had a, a stuck climber up on Gray Rock Mountain, if you're familiar where Gray Rock is. Um, so they were able to show us where they were and the search and rescue team, one of the team leaders or the rescue leader knew the route. So he knew he, he's like, Oh, we need to go from the bottom up versus going up to the top coming down. So that's technology that Lita kind of researches with and then sends out to the five um, dispatch centers or PSAPs here in our County. So they do that as well. And they, they launched that NOCO alert probably about a year ago. Cause that's a language thing. And that's our bad for still saying like, Oh, Lita alerts. Cause that's what we used to call it. And then they launched this no call alert to help it be a better, um, just better way to communicate with our communities. And so it's not just Lita. And then you have to go on and explain what Lita is. Um, you know, it's it's a lot easier to say no call alert because it's your no call alerts, right? So they launched that about a year ago. So if you hear people saying Lita alerts, it's the same thing. And then you can also help correct us. So <laughs> they you don't mean like that. reverse nine one ones or ever bridges. There's been a variety of different terms, but they're all the same. All right, watching the time here. I think we have time for one more question. Is there any any anything else you want to know? So uh, large scale incident, you mentioned sometimes the resources become scarce and you have to reach out to resources that aren't necessarily law enforcement or fire. Um, for instance, like if hurricanes and stuff, you'll see sometimes community organizations come in and provide assistance or community volunteers. What kind of education or training resources would you recommend for community members so they're familiar with terms like incident command or what their role is? So I'll, I'll tackle one of those things. So in some of the larger communities, they um, one of the programs they call uh, CERT or CERT is like community, community emergency response teams, or I think they had some other acronyms like community emergency response programs. And so um, I think that would be one of the things, I guess, if you looked at, you know, waving the magic wand kind of thing, um, and maybe an outcome of this would be investigating something a little further like that type of thing. So what um, what resources come with one of those type of programs? Some of those have um, sort, of, sort of a volunteer program and then a vetting of the volunteers, and then they have resources that go along with training on how you train somebody to be able to assist with whatever the emergency is. So how to help people with turning off their gas so that if there's an earthquake, you do that or flooding, how you turn gas off to do those kind of things or how you can help with um, evacuations. 
and some of those type of things. So they scale those based off of the training and that type of thing. So um, that's one of the kind of structured programs. And I think if you look at um, OEM, let them jump in on it, because that is kind of in a in a wheelhouse of what those guys do for helping to stand those type of things up for. Yeah, yeah. So I know the CERT program that that's a yeah a great program for the community. We in Larimer County, we we're going towards more of a community education type program that we're developing to just educate community members on preparedness and basically what the approach that we're taking is we work a lot with community organizations uh, such as you know the the Red Cross Salvation Army a lot of the partners that can um, assist in, in you know emergency management response um, but obviously they they tie in in, in, in a special way uh, to be able to support some of the things that we might not be able to do um, but they uh, we've seen a kind of a, in the conversation with just any community member or any community organization that uh, participates in you know in an emergency response is volunteerism is down um so yeah the, any of these com uh, community organizations that help in um you know and the work that we do in in emergency management um basically reach out to us and we can connect to folks or organizations that uh serve those functions and and yeah that's basically the model that we're going with in the community education program is um, introduce those partners that are already have kind of systems and, and frameworks to, to accept volunteers um, and kind of get them plugged into them um, and, and do that. And I know the city of Fort Collins might be doing um, a CERT program too, um, kind of relaunching it. So yeah, there's multiple ways to, to get uh, involved. So. And I think with our, we have someone in our office who is our community education person and you guys can reach out to us. And I think that that's a new thing that we haven't really had in our office before. We used to have a, a staff of three just a few years ago. So um, we now have a staff of six for Larimer County OEM. And, and this education piece is a pretty new new uh, thing. So now that uh, curriculum's pretty much been finalized or is being finalized at this point. And then now we're getting prepared to kind of deploy that to different areas of the county. So as people become interested, um, you got, we'll be able to kind of do those different classes and in different communities like Wellington. So, yeah. I'd also add FEMA has some great resources like ICS 100, is that what it's called? Those, I should refresh. If I don't remember what it's called, I should probably take it again. Um, but I know that I went through that training. It's really, really helpful. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time this evening. I'm sure people will kind of stick around if you have individual questions you'd like to ask, but that is all we have formally planned for you. We do have a survey you would like to leave us feedback on the format of this event, we'd of course always love to hear that. There's a QR code or physical um, copies over there. There's also some pamphlets from OEM. Thank you for bringing those. And if you're not signed up for no co alerts, we need to, yeah. <laughs> we'll get you signed up. Thanks, folks. Mayor, now. <laughs>